Hello guys, David Vos here. Well, the sun came out. It's getting warm out today and got a little uh, something done on my uh, organizing and planning and, and rearranging the truck and starting to load and well, we're getting close to start starting that whole thing. I mean, I haven't packed up and put everything in the truck yet, but in a few days we're going to start that. But what I did today was I kind of organized the truck and I started cleaning some things. Had to get the back seat arranged and make sure. I had to go get a a seat cover for the um, front seat and stuff. So I was just messing around with the truck today. But I hope you're having a wonderful day where you are. Guys, I have a ooh, an amazing subject today. This is a subject that I had to pray about. And, and I do a lot of that. I... I I, it, it's, well, usually I kind of just let the Lord guide me on what I'm going to talk about. And, you know, I don't really plan at all what I'm going to talk about. Most days I just, I go, I don't know, what should I talk about today? I say, well, I guess I'll just turn it on and start talking. Today, I want to talk about eschatology and the time of the end and the last days and the coming of the Lord and how it is near. Because this is a problem that a lot of people have had. And I'm finding that there is a need to do a video about exactly what it means that the Lord is coming soon. It's important because if we can find that there's something in the New Testament that's not right, I mean, we can make it say anything we want. I mean, Billy Graham can get up there and say, the Lord is near, you know, and that just means it's always, you know, coming and it's always near. But I want to cover this in a way that is really convincing and truthful. Not not just convincing. You know, we can convince the world of anything. Christianity's been saying for years that Jesus is coming soon. And this is a stumbling block for many because in English, if I were to say to you, Jesus is coming soon, and I even use maybe somewhere in my speech or, you know, maybe I was a, a person who spoke for years and people knew what I had said, they wrote it down. And I was saying, oh, he's coming in this generation or something. And people would write that down. And then let's say that that generation didn't happen. Nothing happened. And people would say I was a false prophet. I mean, we have ex examples of that. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses, they said this generation that saw 1914 would not pass away. <clears throat> in fact, I'll tell you this. Um, I believe that we are in the last generation. I truly do believe that. I think it's been true. It's just that Jehovah's Witnesses didn't have the correct understanding. And I'm going to show and prove that there is a last generation. But we have not really understood what that meant. As far as if I mean the word generation in the sense that there is a group of people that will be born and will not die and, you know, their lifespan, if I mean lifespan, then I do believe that since 1948, we are living in the last generation or the lifespan of those who saw 1948 will not pass. I do believe that. But that's not necessarily what Jesus meant when he said this generation will not pass away. And I'm going to show you that because you could get Billy Graham or some theologian or scholar on television and have a debate and they could say, and they could put that question to him. But because, well, as far as I know, most Christians, all these Christians don't seem to understand the Bible. And because they don't understand the Bible and they believe in the Bible, they kind of ignore that the Bible as it's written does seem to have a contradiction. <clears throat> Didn't all the apostles say it's near, it's coming, it's soon, he's coming quickly, all this stuff. What do they mean? Because 
That's not true if you're taking the words that are written in English that we're reading in English. It does. It's not true because the words were written 2,000 years ago. And if they spoke those words that we're reading here in English, then they were not telling the truth. Now, if Paul, John, James, I mean, we can show you that Peter, all of the apostles that wrote these epistles all said that Jesus is coming soon. Now, I don't know about your definition of the word soon or quickly, but I know that soon doesn't mean 2,000 years. But I'm going to start off with one little point, and then we're going to get into some really deep, interesting points that I don't think the world really understands, and this is this is the, the paradox of it all. It seems like nobody ever understood the Bible, but they misinterpreted it uh, like the way they wanted it to, to be, and it, they were wrong, and the translations are wrong. I guess they did the best they could with the translations they had, and in reading it, it didn't seem like the Bible could be wrong. They were raised on these words. They felt these words. They knew in their bones that Jesus was a, the Messiah. They couldn't deny that, so they tried to make these words fit without actually knowing Koine Greek or these expressions. But let me give you one example then. So in the Bible, we have the word aeonian or anon. Now, aeon just means, like we have this word today, just means an age. It's not any specific time in English. So if you're going to come across this word and translate it age, well, even that wouldn't be correct because you wouldn't know what an age is. Mankind has lost the idea of what an age is. We think it's like some indefinite period of time. In fact, New World Translation, you know, <clears throat> these um, idiots that think they know how to translate the Bible and they're really working for the devil in their hypocrisy, they you actually use that word, time indefinite, as if it doesn't mean anything. And they are so wrong. Now, did they know they were wrong? Did they think that's what it meant? Maybe they did. However, I think that they're still hypocrites because they should have known what they were doing before they wrote it. It doesn't mean an indefinite period of time. It means a particular time that is appointed. These are called the appointed times. And just because mankind today doesn't know what they mean doesn't mean that they don't have meaning. So this word age means 2,000 years. And I'm not going to go any further into that because we've, we've gone over these astrological ages. And today, some people, and you know, most people know that we have these astrological ages. And so sometimes they're called hours. And you say, well, wait a minute, doesn't hour always mean hour? Well, somebody would say, okay, sometimes when the, like John says, it's the last hour, right? Well, what is he, is he crazy? I mean, it wasn't the last hour. What is an hour? An hour is like one hour. He couldn't have meant one hour, so it had to mean something symbolic, right? Maybe not. Because the word hour literally doesn't mean one hour specifically, because it's the same word is primarily translated Related a period of time. Sometimes it's translated to as as a day. A lot of times that's the second meaning, and its third meaning is hour, like in a clock on the day. You know, just one hour of the day. So that's the third meaning. So how could that be? We we have the word hour, and in Greek it's actually hour or hor, hora. So it literally is the same word we're using, but it doesn't mean hour, and yet it does. How could that be? Well, because there are three clocks. One of the clocks is the clock we use for telling time. And there are 12 hours in the day and 12 hours at night. or 24 hours altogether. And these hours then are specifically one of these little degrees on a 360 degree circle. However, there's a larger circle. We have 12 months. And so in that clock or that calendar, the hour is actually a month. 
See? And so it can mean 30 days. But there's another meaning. There is the astrological timetable, and it has hours. But each of those hours, which are sometimes translated days or times or periods, are 2,000 years each. Now, mankind didn't know that, and there might be verses in the Bible like where John says it's the last hour, and people say, see, he was lying, or others will say, no, 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 it's symbolic. Well, even if it was symbolic, he had to have been wrong, because an hour, even a symbolic hour, couldn't be 2,000 years, if you're talking about the hour of a day. So... What I'm trying to say is I'm not going to apologize or, you know, twist the scriptures to try and make it fit. I'm going to show you that we have not understood the Bible. The Bible is actually true. Glory be to the Lord. Oh, man, he's been true all this time. It's not the Lord that messed up. It's us. We don't understand the Bible. And that is so amazing. So. What about this, the day of the Lord is near, right? Near. Oh, it's near. Well, that can't be 2,000 years, can it? Well, let me me show you a verse in Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 14. Now, this is in the Old Testament. It's not the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, it says this. I've got the, the interlinear here so we can look at each and every word specifically as it was penned and get a better word-for-word rendering. Remember, in Hebrew, it's right to left. So it says, Is near day of Yahweh. The great, it is near, and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of Yahweh is bitter. Outcry shall there be, shall the mighty men be, or something. Okay, yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you're reading it word-for-word, but you get the point. Uh, there's a lot of words there, like near, quickly, you know, it's coming quick, it's near, it hastens, and yet, that was written like hundreds of years before Christ. Was it false? Do the Judeans, the Talmudic Judeans, believe that that was false because it did not happen quickly? Well, perhaps what Zephaniah was speaking about in the literal sense did happen quickly. I mean, there's an example of Isaiah where it talks about a virgin that will give birth. Well, people who don't believe in Jesus will point out that, oh, well, Christians are misapplying Scripture and they're not understanding the Scripture uh, the New Testament itself says this is re- this applies to Jesus, who is the child that's born of this virgin. But the Talmudic Judeans will point out that that verse was talking about Isaiah, something that specifically happened. Well, they're being a little dishonest because they know that all of these verses are prophecies. They have a literal fulfillment. The Bible, you know, the Apostle Paul, it's not like he didn't know, right? He's like, oh, uh, we're just twisting the verses. We're the apostles. We've got the the great mystery that's been once and for all revealed, the sacred secret to the apostles and prophets, which has never been revealed that the angels desire to peer into. Oh, but we're just twisting it. We're, we're misapplying these scriptures. I don't think so. And I will prove that Paul was very absolutely certain about what he was talking about. And Paul said, let me show you an example here in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Let me just get the whole thing in context. Um, So, okay, we'll just start with 10. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Who destroyed them? Wasn't it Yahweh that destroyed them because they were complaining or murmuring? Yeah. So, yeah, Paul calls Yahweh the destroyer. Now, verse 11, now all these things happened unto them, that's the Old Testament, Moses and Abraham and these guys, for in samples, 
or example. You know, it's another way of saying that some old English word there, in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Well, that word, see how many mistranslations we have? This is why we've got to go back to the interlinear. That word is the ages. And it's plural. Aeonian. Not, you know, it doesn't just say the age, the end of the age, but the end of the ages. Why ages? Because there's a long run of age, ages. Okay? And there are a specific number of these ages. And we are living in the last age. Now, the apostles, John, Peter, and these guys understood that the Mosaic age had come to an end when Jesus died on that cross. And so they were announcing the last age, which would be 2,000 years. So all that was written in the past was written as a type, a shadow of things to come. The Apostle Paul mentions that there are types and shadows of good things to come. So it was written for us. It wasn't written for them primarily. Even though, you know, I don't know, did did did... did did all the Israelites that were standing there at the Mount of Sinai, did they all get their little King James Version of the Bible? Or at least the Old Testament, and then they read in the, the, the law? Did they? Well, if they had a Torah, all they had was a Torah, right? Because this was before David, King David. He hadn't written the Psalms yet. And this was written before the prophets came. So all they had was these five books of Torah that basically, what did they have? I mean... Yahweh wrote with his own finger on these two tablets of stone and they put it in the, the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know if they even got to go over there and take a look at it once in a while. But they, you know, what happened was Moses spoke all these words, 613 laws, and they all stood around the base of the mountain. They heard it one time and they said, yes, this we will do. And then they went and they started building their tents and doing what they had to do. And, you know, they probably didn't remember everything, but they just, were instructed out of the law by the elders. They didn't have a Bible. So all these little things like, oh, uh, Moses didn't go into the promised land or some, some particular Israelite was struck down from a lightning bolt because he didn't keep the Sabbath correctly. They weren't reading that. It was happening in real time. But it was written not for them, but for us. For the last 2,000 year age, the ages, the end of the ages, this is the last one. So the Apostle Paul knew perfectly well. He wasn't like accidentally correct. He knew what he was writing. And there are a lot of words, for instance, you have a whole bunch of words that in the Bible is translated coming. Right? Whole bunches of words. And they don't all mean just coming. And this is why we're, we're all mixed up. Jesus isn't coming. He's going to have a visit. He's going to visit. These words are pregnant with meaning that we don't understand today. We talk about sin, meaning missing the mark and stuff. Transgression, falling off the path, apostasy, turning around, going the other way. Falling down, not getting back up. Well, this is pregnant with meaning we don't have to. We, we think of sin as some evil thing while well, you're done, right? It just means you fall down. But... When these individuals heard this word, the coming of the Lord, they didn't hear coming. They heard this regal word of a king who comes to visit his subjects. He made the royal visit. But let's go back to where we were reading. Zephaniah. So, did the prophet Zephaniah, when he said that Yahweh was going to come in his wrath, you know, the day of Yahweh, that when he said it was near, when he said it was coming quickly, that it would hasten, did he mean that it was going to come within a particular lifespan? Well, if the prophet Zephaniah believed that, he was a liar. As we've said, uh, Yahweh was, was certainly 
not always, he was a deity of vengeance and he sent lying spirits. And so maybe he did lie, right? But what we're saying is this is a saying. This is a phrase. His prophet didn't mean to lie when he said Yahweh's day is coming, the wrath. I mean, he meant that. Oh, Yahweh meant it. And he knew that it was coming at the end of the age of man. Why would it not come at the end of the age of mankind, of the, the long aeonians, right? Because mankind's evolving. It takes aeons. This is not talking about a day of the Lord, like 24 hours. It's not a day. It never meant a day. It's not supposed to be a day. It's not like we're making this up. It's not like we're trying to twist it. Well, now, let's see. It says a day. Now, you see, the Bible's wrong. No, it's not wrong. It never meant day. And when it said the day is coming and hastening and it's near, well, there's a lot of nuances there, and we'll cover that. But let me show you a couple of verses that people are thinking maybe it didn't happen or the apostles were wrong. So let's take a look at, let's go from, I got a few of these verses. We'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29. And this is in Greek, so it goes from left to right. And it reads, This now I say, brothers, the season is shortened. From now on, let's read that actually in English, okay? I'm going to show you the meaning of the word here, but I want to read it first in English so we can read it and get it the point here. Uh, where was it? Yeah, verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possessed not. And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. Hmm. Now, if Paul thought the world was going to be here another 2,000 years, if he didn't really mean it when he said, there's not much time that remaineth, right? If he didn't mean the time is short, like a few years, then why did he say don't get married? Right? Ah, we got you there, Dave. So the Bible's wrong and Paul didn't know what he was talking about. Well, let's, let's go back and read that in the Greek. Okay, so what is this word season that they translate season? Remember I told you there's a lot of words they translate time, season, day, hour. And it's like mix and match. They have no clue what any of these words mean. Well, I'm about to show you that this word keros, keros, it doesn't mean season, doesn't mean time, doesn't mean day, doesn't mean nothing like that. Look at this. All right. Definition time, season. They're lying. Let's go down. It says time as opportunity. It not just any old kind of time. Like it doesn't mean a period of time, but it means the moment of opportunity or the opportune time. Oh, let's go back with that idea now. So brothers, the opportunity is short? Well, what is that word, short? Well, draw together, wrap it up, right? Shorten it or wrap it up. <laughs> so he's saying that the opportunity needs, we, we have an opportunity right now, we got to wrap it up. Why? Because even though they didn't live in our day, their lives were short they only lived 40, 50 years and they died 60, 70 years at the most, right? In those days. Maybe some of them lived to be 100. I don't know. But in their lifetime, they had an opportunity. And the Apostle Paul said, he says, I don't know if I have attained yet. Not that I have attained, he said, but I go forward to get the prize. See, in everybody's lifetime, we have to seize the opportunity. This has nothing to do with time, and the time being short, the time of the end, or anything like that. This is just mistranslated, as most of the scriptures usually are. So, all right, what about 
1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Here's what John says. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Hmm. Well, let's take a look at that in the Greek. All right, there it is. Little children, the last hour. There's the word hora. Hmm. Well, hora, hour, sure is the same word, isn't it? So it must mean hour, right? Let's look. 5, 6, 10. Definition, a time or a period, an hour, any of those things. Usage, a definite space of time, but not an hour specifically. A season, and B, an hour. So A is just any specific period of time. B, definition is hour. And C, a particular time for anything. Anything! All right? Now, let's go down here and go on a little bit more. It says properly an hour figuratively, a finite season, limited time or opportunity to reach a goal, to fulfill a purpose. A divinely preset time period. A limited period. Now, how in the world could the word hour, that if the word hour does have something to do with time on a clock and, a, you know, literally means one hour in a day, then why would it mean any specific period of time? It doesn't. They don't know what it means. You see? This definition or usage is because of this is the way they translated it 500 years ago in the King James Bible. And today, nobody really wants to get to the bottom of any of this. But as we have been showing you on this channel, this word hour is a symbolic word. They didn't intend for it to mean one hour. That's pretty obvious in the context. It's some kind of symbolic word that represents an hour. But what could it mean? Well, as I've said, there's astrological day that lasts 24,000 years. And each of the days is 2,000 years. Well, Peter says a day unto the Lord is like 1,000 years. Now, I thought you said 2,000. Well, that's because there is 12 hours in the day and 12 hours at night, which makes 24 hours. And so a whole day includes a day and a night, and it would be 2,000 years to, to reach the entire... So that's one cycle, which we're calling this whole aeonian. But sometimes in the Bible they would say the word day and they just meant just the daylight and it would be a thousand years. But do you see how appropriate this word is when you understand it? Remember, when Jesus came, he was telling the world, I'm going to end this old world. Remember what he said? Not one jot or tittle of the law will in any way pass away until heaven and earth passes away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now we get the whole full scope of what all these symbols are, are, are really saying. I mean, all these are symbols, days and hours and, and, and heavens and the earth passing. Is it really talking about the literal earth passing away? Then why does the Old Testament say that the earth shall remain forever? Why does it say there'll be a new earth? Is it really a new earth? Remember what Peter said the heavens that were of old, right, and the earth that was of old passed away. How? In the flood. And we're awaiting a new heavens and a new earth wherein, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And the earth that is now is reserved for fire. But it doesn't mean that the whole earth is going to be burned up. It's a symbolic cleansing. We cleanse the earth with water, the outer cleansing. And then the, the cleansing of the with the fire is the is the purging right down to the elemental, you know, dross and this, this fire, the silver and the gold goes into the fire and it comes out beautiful silver and gold. The outer, more carnal nature of the world will, will be what's passing away. The old age of the law, the dispensation of the law was passing away and a new age was coming, the age of grace. So it's appropriate that these uh, apostles were saying this is the last hour because we were entering into the last age at the death of Jesus Christ. Now some people think it was at the 
at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70. But that's not what Daniel says. And, you know, it, 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 you know, Jesus was saying that he, when he, he was on the earth alive when he was saying it's about to happen. It's near. And he meant it because he was about to go to the cross and defeat Satan. And he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. I went to hell and I got the keys of death and Hades. It's over. I paid the debt. See, so now as Christians, we're going to become new creatures. We're going to be living in the new heavens and the new earth. Well, wait a minute. You know, isn't that new heavens coming still? It's not here yet. Well, it's it's being built right now with spiritual stones being one stone placed on top of another. It, it, it did. It was established when Jesus died on this on that cross and Jesus sat at the right hand of his father. And at some point. He he it says he sits at the right hand until all of his enemies are placed as a stool for his foot. So his kingdom began and he began. He says all power is given to me. In heaven and upon earth, Jesus had that power. And it came in power when they got the Holy Spirit. However, the Bible says that there was an opening of the bottomless pit and the devil came back. Why? Because we had to go through this trial because we had to make a decision as to whether or not we wanted to accept Jesus' kingdom, which was already being manifested and coming on the clouds of heaven, on the storm clouds of all this wickedness that's in the world. So, so it's almost as if the age that started when Jesus died made a new creation and the old world was still there but is fading away. So the, the apostles actually say stuff like this. They talk about the, this kingdom which is passing away. Not that it had passed. But they said that it would eventually pass. But right now it was passing. And this is why we as Christians can be in the Lord's kingdom and the world can still be in their little world. And following after their deity and their laws. So ultimately, Jesus' kingdom is forever and ever. But we're living in the last hour. So we'll get into all of the particulars of that here in a minute. But right now, we just want to establish that there was a last hour that lasted 2,000 years that was just at that time that the apostles were preaching and declaring it that we were in the last hour. So let me show you how that is spoken by some of the apostles. So, Matthew 24, 34. Now, here's another point that people bring up. Didn't Jesus say that the generation that was in his day would not pass away? Didn't he say that? Well, if he said that, then Jesus is a liar. Oh, that is not true. G I guarantee, I will promise you beyond any doubt that Jesus is not a liar. And Jesus said that heaven and earth would pass away and that this generation, okay, whatever he meant by that, will not pass away until all things be fulfilled. Either Jesus lied, which we know he did not. I mean, at least we ought to assume before we go into this. If we're Christians, maybe we don't know what it means, but don't we already have a witness within our heart that Jesus is not a liar? I know that. I know he's not a liar. I'm not going to go into this thinking, well, he must have lied. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to the Lord and pray and say, Lord, what do you mean? Remember when Jesus told his disciples, drink my blood and eat my flesh, and they, many of them left and, and stopped following Jesus. And Jesus said, are you going to go too? And, and Peter said, where else shall we go, Lord? You have the sayings of eternal life. And so then Jesus took them privately and explained what he meant. It was a symbol. So what does it mean here in Matthew 24, verse 34? Okay, so he says in verse 32, we'll start there. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. 
So likewise, when ye see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Okay. So is he saying that the generation that was alive in his day, his disciples, those people that were standing there at that moment listening to him, that they, that they would not die before all things were fulfilled? No, he said, when you see all the things that I'm telling you, know that it is near. Verse 34, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So, he's not saying then in that verse, that that was the last generation. But, let me show you further how we have misunderstood this. Let's take a look at that word, generation. Let's get it in the interlinear. And it's the word genia. Well, we have that word today. Gene, right? Genetics. Okay, we don't usually use that word to mean a lifespan, do we? If I said your genetics, do I mean your lifespan? No, I mean your ethnicity, your race, your genetics. Your, you know, what am I, what, what is that word mean? Let's just look. 1074, genia. Definition, race, family, generation. Well, what, generation doesn't mean a lifespan. What does it mean? It means a race and a family. So what race or family is it that will not pass away? Well, let's take a look. Matthew 12, 34. Jesus says, you brood of vipers. A brood. <laughs> well, like, what is a brood, right? Like, a, I guess uh, you, when you're talking about a bunch of geese, you use the word gaggle, right? Okay. O oh, generation of vipers. Oh, well, this is the King James. It's generation of vipers. That other one said brood. How can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So Jesus is calling them a generation of vipers. So the word generation there doesn't mean a lifespan. It means a race. And they were a race of vipers or a whole brood or a whole, well, family. Their whole family of them. And he was speaking to the Judeans. So, I'm not going to go much more into that today. But we could do a whole video on that. So, how about Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27. The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Then it says, verily, well, you might say in English, we might say, in fact, I tell you, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, what could that possibly mean? Some have thought that, that what he meant there, because there's a lot of people that don't know the meaning of the Bible, and they're just trying to understand it, and so they want to put one verse together and study it and try to figure out what it means. And it doesn't mean they always get it right. But notice that the very next verse in the next chapter is Matthew 17, verse 1. It says, After six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain, apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with them. So, you can read this whole thing. And so some will say, well, see, some of them standing here was Peter, James, and John. And they got to see the kingdom in a vision. Well, I think that's only a small part of it. Because I don't think he came in his kingdom. I don't think that's what he meant. I don't think 
Really, that's what it meant. You see, it wasn't long after that that Jesus died. Jesus hadn't sat at the right hand of his father until he died and he conquered the devil and was raised up. And when he raised up, he entered into his kingdom. His kingdom is no part of this world. And all the saints, when we, you know, partake of his kingdom, we're not partaking of this world or this kingdom. Does that mean that he's not coming to receive him un, us unto himself? Does it mean that this old world will not pass away? No, it will. And there's a time appointed for that. But what Jesus was saying is even those who are standing here will witness me going, raising from the dead. There will be darkness over the land. The tent in the temple, the, the curtain will be rent. You'll see people coming up out of their graves. And 50 days later, you shall receive power from on high. So the kingdom came in power when the apostles got the Holy Spirit. However, there's a difference between Jesus coming, you see him coming and his arrival to receive us unto himself and the end of the age. He didn't say there are some standing here today that will see the end of this age and the kingdom established worldwide because it's, it doesn't work that way. This is going to be not slow, but patient. A day in the Lord is like a thousand years. He's going to start coming. This last hour or 2,000 years is going to happen. And we're going to start gathering and looking and seeking out the sheep and preaching the gospel. But it's going to get interrupted, the gospel, because the devil's going to come out of the bottom of the pit. And Paul says it will not come. He's gathering it together unto him. Until the apostasy comes first. What is Paul talking about? And the man of sin shall be revealed. He's talking about Daniel and the 70 weeks and the seven times and all of this stuff. And there's a lot of particulars that's got to take place. So Jesus is not saying you're going to witness, some of you standing here, you're going to witness the whole thing. It's all going to be done and over with. He's just saying you're going to see it coming with power. You're going to get the Holy Spirit. The latter rain is coming after, but you'll get the former rain. We've got to take things in context, line upon line, and divide correctly the word. We have to rightly divide the word. I know that many people did probably didn't really know how long. Although I do believe that those people who knew the mysteries, even in those days, like Essenes and stuff, understood that the age, that there were these ages and that these ages were 2,000 years long. I think they knew that. Did the Apostle Paul know for sure that it was going to be another 2,000 years? before the end of that age and then the angels came and separated the sheep from the goats and all the uh, particulars? Maybe they didn't know or fully understand. But it's not like Jesus or anybody lied. Because, you see, this phraseology is specific. It does not err. If you understand the esoteric meaning of all of this, you will, if you, if you really dig deep and, and, learn these mysteries, you'll see that this is actually why it was couched in these very strange words like the hour, the day, right? There's a dragon coming in the sky and there's a woman clothed with the sun and all that stuff. It's words that don't initially give you all the answers. Jesus purposefully spoke in these kind of parabolic terms. So he said, listen, if you don't believe that I'm going to come and set up my kingdom and that this world that you're living in will be done away, that we're going to have an immortal kingdom. You can't, look, we're, we're looking for his immortal, eternal kingdom where we never die. So it has nothing to do with this carnal world. But yes, the carnal world will eventually go away. We're all going to graduate and go on to the higher world. And there will come a time when Jesus will return. He promised us that. And he used different words like to come to visit, to bring the, the judgment upon the world. And he couched all of this in symbols. If you read it very carefully and prayerfully, you'll see 
that everything is accounted for. So Jesus was telling them that the kingdom would be coming and then it would come. That there would be waves like seven vials and seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls of wrath. And, you know, you'd get to the seventh one and that would open up another seven. And finally, during this period of time, the world will be separated, the sheep from the goats, because of this lesson. And at the very last days of this great eschatological time period that Daniel specifically tells us about in a very coded, symbolic book that all the apostles made reference to, that Jesus said, Spoken by Daniel the prophet, let the reader use discernment. Let the reader have wisdom. You can't just read this and take it literally. That's not what he was trying to say. This is a symbolic expression that you will see the Son of Man coming. It doesn't say you will see him arrive and set up his kingdom immediately. It's not what he's, he's not saying I'm going to get rid of the devil and Give everybody their white robes and, and give everybody their crowns and everybody's going to get... Look, at how could that happen? We're human beings. If the Bible is true, then it's a story about our advancement to eternal life. We're going through a classroom. It takes a long time to learn. A day unto the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Why did Peter say that? If he If Peter knew that the end of the world was coming in that generation, then why did he say, hey, the Lord's not slow? He's patient because the day in the Lord is like a thousand years. Peter knew this was going to take a thousand years or more. Right after Peter says that the, the Lord is not slow, but he's patient, a day in the Lord is like a thousand years. Then he says the earth is being reserved for fire. He knew. Paul knew. They, they weren't trying to tell us exact things. Only those who had this wisdom by means of the Holy Spirit would even understand these things. So, now, let's go to Matthew 26, 64. So, let's start with uh, verse 62. The high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living deity, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of Deity. And Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. This is not something literal. Jesus isn't going to come flying out of the sky on the clouds. We covered that about a week ago. I did a whole video about the clouds, how Jesus comes in the clouds. The New Testament isn't the only book that has this symbology. Yahweh talked about these clouds. Joel chapter 2 talked about these thick day of the Lord, the thick clouds and the gloom and the war and the battle cry and the trumpets. They're not literal trumpets. You're not going to get up one morning and hear this. And here comes Jesus down coming out of the clouds. This is eschatology. This is beautiful symbolisms, friends. And for those who have eyes to see and are humble and will listen to the Holy Spirit, you will get an inkling and then you'll begin to get a trickle of this information coming into your soul will lighten up your being. And then after a period of time of fasting and prayer, the Lord will reveal this to you. That yes, it's a spiritual kingdom and it's within us. But that does not take away from the fact that the physical world will eventually be wrapped up and Jesus will come and receive us unto himself. That will actually happen. We will see him as he is. He is coming literally, not on a cloud, but in a symbolic cloud in the storms and in the trouble that's coming in his judgment. And all the world will see the judgment as it comes and the brightness of his coming. 
which will dispel the darkness. But we will be changed and all the saints will be around his throne and we will see him as he is. We'll shake his hand. We'll talk to him. We'll hold his hand. He will look us in the eye. He'll put his, his arms around us. He's our Lord and our Savior. What does it mean in Revelation 22.20? 20? He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. He's coming soon. Let's take a look at that in the Greek. And says the one testifying. Remember, at the beginning of this book, Revelation 1, 2, and 3, chapter 1, he says, That I, John, receive these things from the angel who gave them to me in signs and in symbols. And then we see these astrological signs. The dragon that's in the heavens and this woman arrayed with the sun. She's got 12 star. 12? That's astrology. These are the signs. Astrological signs. So, they're symbols and they're prophetic. And they talk about the ages and the plan. Because the, the plan of the Lord, you know, he's patient. It takes thousands of years. A day in the Lord is like a thousand. This is a great, long, beautiful plan. So we have to understand it that way. Verse 20. The one testifying these things, yes, I am coming. Quickly. Amen. What is that word quickly? Speedily. Well, taxi. Drive from 5036. Here's what the word means, with unnecessary delay. This root, tax, emphasizes the idea promptly, without unjustified time lapse. Immediacy is conveyed by 2112, ethios, straight away, right away. But that's not this word. This word has to do with, without unnecessary delay. So Jesus is saying, I'm not going to mess around. I'm going to sum it up. I'm going to wrap it up without unnecessary delay. That does not necessarily mean that he has to do it quickly in the sense of a few days. Because as we said, he's not slow respecting his promise, but he is patient with us. For a day unto the Lord is like a thousand years. Peter understood it would be a long time, but it would not be any longer than what it needed to be. It's not going to be unnecessary delays. That's all this is saying. It does not mean soon. It has nothing to do with time here or a time period. There's no lies being spoken here. Jesus says, look, I'm going to come as quickly as I can without any unnecessary delays. If he had meant straight away, right away, absolutely I'm coming quickly, he would have used this other word, 2112, Euthius. But he didn't. So. Now, let's look at uh, Matthew 10, 23. Let's get that in context here in the King James Version. And it says, But when they persecute you in this city, flee you into another for verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So here's another little place where Jesus is talking to his disciples. And if you're just reading it in this English translation, knowing, of course, that this is a lot of sometimes parables and, 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 and stuff, and Jesus says things a little bit shocking sometimes, Sometimes he says something vague because he's either trying to hide things for an appointed time. Maybe it wasn't for them at that time to really understand this. But is this some kind of a lie? Absolutely not. Just like Zephaniah where Yahweh says his, his day hastens and comes quickly, but, he, but it didn't mean that literally. This is the same thing here. He says... When ye, he's not speaking of Peter himself in that one lifetime, although I, I don't 
doubt that he is talking about Peter and the disciples. Because remember, this race will not pass away means that Israel is still going to be on the earth. Like the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And these individuals who have been hypocrites and got to sit in the, the, the big seat, made themselves kings and royal and started ruling over us unjustly. Remember when Jesus gave the parable, he says he uh, had a, a vineyard, an orchard, and he put this steward over it, a hired hand. And when he returned, this guy was beating his fellow servants. Like, who are you? Why are you beating my, my, my help? The people on my farm, my, you know, these are my children. You're beating my, you're, you're a bad steward. And he fired him, right? So who was the one that was in charge? It was Moses, the law, the Judeans. They're in charge. They're beating their fellow servants and the Lord's not happy with them. And they got to go first. They got all the good things. But their sin remains. As they said, may his blood be upon us and our children. So, here he's talking about ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel. He's not saying any specific time. He didn't say this generation. He didn't say you're not going to ever die. In fact, he told Peter, you're going to die. Right? He says, John, you're going to tarry. But then the next line indicates that John would die too. Because that saying went forth that John would not die, but he did not say he shall not die, but only that he would tarry until he comes. So he would die. But this is a symbolic wording of that something we've got to interpret and understand that John is somebody who's going to return. Like it says in Revelation, John, you will again prophesy before peoples and nations and tongues. So we got to have cross references and understand this by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is saying that this is going to be a while. And guess what? We're still going out to preach the kingdom in all the inhabited earth for a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. See, when we get to everybody, then the end will come. Well, the Lord has this all in his own timetable. It's destiny. And yeah, the Judeans, that race, they're still here and they're still fighting. And we haven't gone over all the cities of Israel. Now, America hadn't even wasn't even present in his day. He spoke of generations that would come after and that all of this history that would happen, the church would suffer through all of these things. The day of the Lord's like a thousand years. He's not slow. He's patient. Now, let's look at Matthew chapter 23 and let's start with verse 35. That upon you may come all the righteous blood. Who's he talking to? He's standing there looking at the Sanhedrin. And he says, upon you guys, remember he called them a brood of vipers, a generation of vipers. It didn't mean a lifespan. He meant a race. And he says, talking to this brood here, this uh, race, he says, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this. Well, I'll be darned, this generation didn't happen, huh? Hmm. Nope. That word is not generation. It is what? It says, all these things upon this generation. What is that word? 1074. Definition, a race, family. So generation doesn't mean a lifespan. He didn't say all this will come upon your lifespan in this life. He's talking to a specific, he's talking to a specific race or brood of vipers. Remember what they said? May his blood be upon us. They're the ones who got the high seat. Jesus said, you're going to sit in the low seat. Those who be first shall be last. They're the ones who are first now. They're running around in Hollywood. They get to be all the movie stars. They get to have all the money. They get to run everything. And they treat us like nothing. I won't say anymore. But that's what the word means. It means a race. 
Now let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. So, now is Peter contradicting himself when he said, you know, a day in the Lord's like a thousand years, he's not slow? I don't think so. Isn't it weird that they just got to get the translation wrong and mislead the world? Perhaps the devil had his hand in that, right? He couldn't take away the word, but he could mistranslate it. So let's take a look at that in the in the Greek. Of all, now the end has drawn near. Let's look at end. That's that word telos. Remember I was saying the other day that when Jesus was on the cross, he, he said, it is finished. And that word there is telos. What does it mean? I told you it meant it has been paid. So let's take a look at that. Definition, an end or a toll. It's used throughout the Bible to mean a tax. So the first word is a termination or the limit. That's the first meaning they think it has to do with. Um, number two is toll or custom, an indirect tax on goods. So in other words, once you paid it, it's over. You paid it in full. It's the, the culmination. So, is anything to do with time here? Is he talking about the payment that Jesus gave? Because Jesus paid for everything, right? Not necessarily. Because remember, many didn't even receive Jesus' ransom. And they'll actually have to die and they won't be saved or delivered from the wrath to come. They'll go through the wrath. But all of us who have received the love of the truth that we might be saved, which just means delivered from the wrath to come, and we don't have to you know, be drinking this condemnation because we're examining ourselves, as the Apostle Paul says. And therefore, we're not like the others who are some sick and weak and many are dead because they didn't examine their lives and they, were, they had to suffer through death itself. But for those who believe in Jesus, it's already been paid. But the end payment, when everything is summed up and the debt is paid for all the world. Has drawn near. Is that saying specifically a few years from now it's all going to be over? What does the word drawn near mean? 1448. It says to come near to make near. All right, but what, what is the root of that word? 1448, Egizo from 1451 near, properly has drawn close. So it's not just near in time, but in space to something that's close or nearby. And this is why they translate it, it's at hand. You could reach it. So the cost or the payment for this world is right at your hands. You could reach out and receive the Holy Spirit right now and it would all be done and over for you. Because you received the Lord Jesus. And that is an offer that the, the disciples said is open to anyone and at any time. We don't have to suffer in this world. We only suffer to be disciplined. We're, the Lord doesn't allow, you know, us to suffer for nothing. We're suffering so that we can learn. We learn by the things in which we suffer. But the payment and the end of all of that suffering is at your fingertips. The opportune time is now. It's present. Always present. But again, that does not change the fact that for the world there's coming a great day of judgment. You and I know that that judgment's already been paid. You see, this is not something that you can just read it literally and get the sense of it. And this is why he reveals it unto the babes and hidden it from those who are wise. But anyway, I see we're over an hour again and I think I kind of covered most everything I wanted to cover there today. 
And I hope that helped to kind of put things in perspective. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and go and get this loaded. I hope you have a wonderful day. And may the Lord bless you guys. Have a good one. See you tomorrow.